hopefully the last time we're going to get to hear the Lord speak through Anoush. <laughs> I know. Thank it, you to the one person. <laughs> that's the president of his fan club. <laughs> and so, um, if you don't know, Anoush and Grace and the family are moving to uh, Maryland. Um, Anoush will be taking off sometime in the next month or so. And uh, starting a, a practice there. i um, not sure what to call it because he has so many MDs and DMs and um, THMs and uh, after his name that um, it's kind of embarrassing to stand up here with him, actually. <laughs> but uh, anyway, I just uh, want to say that um, we are going to be looking into uh, nonstop airline tickets from Baltimore for our new guest speaker. <laughs> Every other week, <laughs> since you won't have much to do there with the new practice. Nope. Uh, and uh, I just want to say I'm so appreciative of him offering his gifts, um, working, coming here sometimes after not sleeping for a day and a half, and walking in and then teaching for three services. Uh, I don't know when he sleeps, really, but um, I'm appreciative of anyone who uses their gifts, especially in the uh, context in which he has used them the last a number of years. So thank you so much. We love you and bless you. Thank you, Pastor. Thank you. 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 I should speak at the third service only. <laughs> this morning we're going to look at a... Um, very common verse, Romans 8.28. And if you have your Bibles, please turn to Romans 8.28. In a sermon entitled Chocolate Cake, uh, we will look at Romans 8.28. Let me read the verse for you. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. Let me read it again. And we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. This is a common verse that we've read many times or we've heard said many times. It's all for good. It'll all work out. It'll all, it's, it's, it's all for good. But this is a promise. And like every other promise in scripture, the promise comes with a condition. So what are the conditions or what are the criteria for this promise? It's not, this promise is not for everybody. It's for those who fulfill the criteria. The uniqueness of the 2000 Christopher Nolan movie, Memento, is that the story is narrated backwards. So the first opening scene of the movie is the last scene of the movie, and then they work the whole story of the movie backwards. I didn't understand the movie the first time I saw it. I didn't understand the movie the second time I saw it, so I, so I read up the story on Wikipedia, and I still I don't think I've got the story. But this sermon is going to be that way. So we're going to start backwards, start at the end of the verse, and then work its way back, and we'll see how we, um, and, and, and we'll see what we learn from it. So for this promise, there are two criteria. Okay, the first criteria is that God calls us. That is a criteria. Those who are called according to his purpose. This is something God does. Now there are three kinds of calls that are written in scripture. One is a vocational call. God has called you to a vocation, a ministry, a service, a job, a work. That is a vocational call. So Paul says, I've been called to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That was his vocational call. The second kind of call in scripture is what is called as an external call. It is the call of the gospel. So when, if I stood here and spoke the gospel, that is called the external call. You, the call of the gospel is going out. This is the preaching, inviting people to repent. And sometimes we use the word invite uh, to mean, okay, we are begging people to get converted or begging people to repent. But that's not the picture in scripture. For in Acts chapter 17 and 30 it says, In the past God overlooked such ignorance, but now he commands all people to repent. Third is what is called as the internal or the effective call. 
This is the call that is kind of a summons from the king of the universe. And it has such power in its call that it guarantees a response from the person that is, that is being called. So it is, a, it is a call that Romans that, that Paul talks about in Romans chapter 8 verse 30 where he says, those who were called were justified. So the justification is guaranteed for anybody who has received this call. And this call is an internal call, something that happens within the heart. So the two differences between so the differences between the two kinds of call, the internal and the external call, is that the external call is general for everybody. The internal call is particular and individual. The external call is external from the outside, the gospel call. The internal call or the effective call is internal and works in the heart of a person. The external call is many times or almost always rejected without the internal call. So if I speak the gospel today and somebody repents, it is because the external call happened and the internal call happened and it happened at the same time. So it says, those who are called according to his purpose. So the call of God is based on the purpose of God. What do we know about the purpose of God? Isaiah 14 verse 24 says, The Lord Almighty has sworn, surely as I have planned, so it will be, and as I have purposed, so it will happen. If God has purposed something, it will happen. The call of God is based on the purpose of God. So the first criterion for the promise to work is that God has called you. Second is that we love him. Everything that we do should be based of, on, his, on our love for him. So obedience, discipleship, Christian ministry, everything should be based off our, on our love for him. John 14, 15 says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. So, in this phrase, the, and we know God causes all things to work together for good to those who love God. Let me just go a little more deeper. The verb work and the participial phrase, those who love him, are in the present tense. So, in the Greek, by default, it becomes into the present continuous tense. Okay? So, God working things out for good is in the present continuous tense. Us loving God is in the present continuous tense. And us loving God is one of the criteria for God to work out everything for our good. It is as if our continuous loving is the basis on which God works out everything for our good. Because that is one of the criteria. God's work for a person who has ongoing love for him is not a small thing. For in 1 Corinthians 2 and verse 9 it says, However, as it is written, what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, and what no human mind has conceived, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. So there are two criteria for us to take this promise to heart. One is that God calls us. That is an event in the past. God has called us. The second is an ongoing love for him. If either of those two are not fulfilled, the promise is not for you. Now let's look at the promise. All things work together for good. What is good? What does it mean when we say it is good? Or I'm good? It's going to be good. Romans 8 verse 29 says, For those whom God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son. So goodness is about being conformed to the image of his Son. That may be a bummer for a few people, because when we say, you know, God is going to do good, sometimes we think it's because um, God wants to give us more wealth, or God wants to give us a better house, God wants to give us a decent car, God wants to give us um, a raise, God wants to give me a job, a, a better job, whatever. Um, a few months ago, we, 
we went to the circus. And so we took our kids to the circus. We had a babysitter come and handle uh, Abram because he's no fun at a circus. <laughs> so he, so the babysitter came to handle the third uh, kid. We, we took the elder two kids. We went to the circus. But my daughter wanted to stay with the babysitter. Well, that's because she does not understand what a circus is. If only she knew what a circus was, she would never choose to sit with a babysitter. Now, if there are babysitters in the audience, I'm not trying to say that you're no fun. <laughs> but you're, if you're as much fun as a circus, then something is definitely going wrong in the house. <laughs> My daughter didn't know how much fun a circus was, and therefore she opted, she wanted to stay with the babysitter. So when we say that good is being conformed to the likeness of Jesus Christ, we don't know the depth of that, and so we are happy asking God for the frivolous little things that we ask God. Good is confirming to the likeness of Jesus Christ. Last month was my last month at Truman Medical Center, and I, um, during one of our rota um, during our work, we have med students that come and rotate um, on on our service. And so one afternoon, I was sitting down with some med students, and uh, we were just talking. And um, I asked them, "Which is who, who is one person in history that you or your kid would like to be like?" So then they talked about somebody in Hollywood, they want to be the stud. Um, and then, or they wanted to be some, some, like some sports star. But then, you know, people in Hollywood, we see just the superficial part of them, we don't know how they are. Um, people who are sports stars, we see just that one dimension of them, of being a good athlete. We don't know if they're a good husband or a good wife. And so, uh, so we just see that one aspect of them. So I told them, you know what, you just see this one aspect, you don't really, you don't know if you want to be like them. So then we eventually settled on being like one religious figure. So we kind of talked about which religious figure would you want to be like? So we went down the list, there were a couple of Hindus on the, on, on that, um, around the table, and they mentioned some Hindu gods. And so then I asked them, when was so and so born? And they kind of looked up and, huh, we had never thought of that. Because there is no birth date for Hindu gods. Because nobody was born. It, was, it is Hindu mythology. So I said, okay, I, we can't go off of myths. So is there a historical person that you would like to be like? Eventually they came to Jesus Christ. Because there is nobody else. If there is somebody else, let me know. I would, I would, I would, I would love to know. Nobody else. Max Lucado, in his book, When God Whispers Your Name, wrote these words. It is noteworthy that the Almighty didn't act high and mighty. The Holy One wasn't holier than thou. The one who knew it all wasn't a know-it-all. The one who made the stars didn't keep his head in them. The one who owns all the stuff of earth never strutted it. His purpose was not to show off, but to show up. And he went great pains to be as human as the guy down the street. He didn't need to study at all, but still went to the synagogue. He had no need for income, but still worked in the workshop. He had known the fellowship of angels and had heard the harps of heaven, but still went to parties thrown by tax collectors. And upon his shoulders rested the challenge of redeeming creation, but still took time to walk 90 miles from Jericho to Cana to go to a wedding. They called him a blasphemer, but they never called him a braggart. They accused him of heresy, but never arrogance. He was branded as a radical, but never called unapproachable. And what God wants to do in your life and mine is to make you like Jesus Christ. All things work together for good. Are all things good? No. All things are not good. Everything that happens in your life is not good. Is death good? Is cancer good? Is joblessness good? Is divorce good? Is murder good? Is poverty good? 
Is hunger good? Is evil good? No. The last time everything was good was in the Garden of Eden. Everything was good. Nothing has been all good since then. But all things work together for good. Work together is a compound word that is present in what is called as the present active indicative. It means all things continue to work in cooperation with one another for the good. And if you want to go a little more deeper into Bible study, in Romans 8 verse 26, a few verses before this, a couple of verses before this, it says that the Spirit helps us in our weakness and the word for helps is the same word work together. So, when it says work together, it means that all these things work together in cooperation with one another. I'm going to take this time and um, thank Pastor for giving me the chance in the last five and a half years, um, six years, to speak here. Um, I worked a busy schedule. I worked between 80 and 100 hours a week for the last seven and a half years, uh, but I've been here six and a half years. And Pastor was so... Um, accommodating he said anytime you want to speak just let me know and there are times he had to rearrange schedules um, just so I could I could have the chance to speak and I really really appreciate it um, uh, I've been helped more by speaking here than I think any of you have uh, and listening he's one of the most spiritual people I've seen um, he is a person who has um, is confident of the vocational call that God has placed upon his life. Therefore, it's open for him to let others speak. Um, I want to thank the people that are here six years ago when we came here. Um, we have no family. Our closest family is Chicago or Dallas. We have no family here, but we have gained a lot of friends here. Um, thank you for your support. There are so many people that um, listened. You guys were tortured by the sermons you heard uh, here. Uh, emailed me with questions. Uh, I really appreciate that. Um, um, I, I have a difficulty remembering faces. And so um, there are times I've seen you, I've met you, but I don't remember your face. There was this one time... Um, few years ago, it was a week that Bev's, uh, I think mom died that week. I was supposed to speak that Sunday. Um, and so I come and so I think it happened on a Friday, Thursday or Friday, and I came here to speak on Sunday. Um, and I went out to the lobby and I um, met Scott Hickok's wife, Amy Hickox, and I told her I'm sorry for your loss. I had no idea. <laughs> I was so glad that day that I had an accent because she had no idea what I said. <laughs> yeah. Thank you for all the support. Thank you for all your friendship. So, if, you know, when I meet people after the service, what you don't see is the panic that goes on inside my head. Um, Thank you for your support, including the family that went after uh, listening to a sermon of mine and had Indian food. Thank you. <laughs> and this is my last sermon here. Um, I finished a residency. I finished med school at UMKC. Finished a residency in maxillofacial surgery. Uh, we are moving to Maryland uh, to start private practice there. I'm taking a call at a couple of hospitals working there. Um, I've put my email address. If you have any questions about the sermons, uh, you can always email me. Um, if you have any hate mail, you can send those to scott at lcf.liberty.com. <laughs> so in light of that, I thought we'll, that I would make a chocolate cake for everybody. Um, but then it was too much work, and so I decided that I would just give a slice of a chocolate cake for every single person. Uh, but that was also too much work, and so I thought, maybe I'll just give the ingredients to everybody, and we can just have the ingredients. So I'm going to give uh, all-purpose flour, sugar, some good cocoa powder, uh, baking soda, baking powder, kosher salt, buttermilk, 
vegetable oil, eggs, and vanilla extract. This is Ina Garten's recipe from Food Network, so you know it's good. Um, so I sent, uh, so, so this proposal to send, uh, to, to give you guys the ingredients was shot down by the leadership team, so that's not going to work. But um, the, the goal was to give you all just every ingredient, and then hopefully by the time it reaches your duodenum, it turns up to be chocolate cake. But that's not how things work, is it? The taste of the chocolate is brought out by the other ingredients, and everything needs to work together. It's got to work together. The salt doesn't make the chocolate cake, neither does the cocoa powder. It's got to work together. God, in his infinite wisdom, knew that you needed that experience that you hated going through. All things work together for good. Everything. Every ingredient in that cake is necessary. Every single thing that happens in our lives is ordained by God. And God does not waste anything. Even the good, the bad, and the ugly. One of my worst seasons of my life was uh, six months, the latter half of 2007. I was in New Orleans and I was miserable. I hated my life. It was just tedious work. I remember one week in 2007, the first week of November, when I worked 150 hours. I got to count how many hours were there in that week, 168 hours. I worked 150 hours of that week. That was one of the most difficult seasons of my life. And I thought seven years later that I could turn back and know why I went through that season. I don't know why. Sometimes we go through life and go through a painful experience and we think, you know, maybe later I will know why I went through the experience. Let me tell you something. God is not obligated to, to explain why he took you through an experience. He doesn't have to tell you why. In fact, even when you get to heaven, there is no requirement that you should know why you went through certain experiences. Because it's not like we, be, it's, it's not like we become gods in heaven with knowledge, with full knowledge. We are still human in heaven. So what are the bad things that happen? It's usually discipline for a person who is called by God and who is constantly loving God. So I see three classes of discipline. This is uh, from these words. Um, the terms are taken from a, a sermon that I read a long time back from John MacArthur. But the more I thought about it, I realized that there were actually three levels of discipline. So the first level is what is called as a retributive discipline. This is for a person who goes from one sin to the next sin to the next sin to the next sin to the next sin and all they face is punishment of each sin. You face one punishment, you go to the next sin. You do that sin, God gives you the next discipline and you just go from discipline to discipline just because you are sinning all the time. So that person is always sinning. The second stage is what is called as preventative. For those who are always on the edge of sin. And so God is always giving discipline to prevent them from going into sin. And so they're at the next level up. They're not constantly in sin, but they're always on the very edge of sin. And God is always preventing them from going into sin. So the example for the first the retributive sin will be in 2 Samuel chapter 11. Uh, David's sin with Bathsheba resulted in the death of his child. An example for the preventative sin would be in Exodus 13, 17, when God didn't let the people of Israel go the shorter route. Instead, he took them through the desert as he led them out of Egypt. He was trying to prevent them from falling into sin. But then there is the third level of discipline, which is the educative level of discipline. 
That has nothing to do with sin. You may be a person that is not bound by sin too much. You may be a person that who is not constantly on the edge of sin. But God will still give you educative discipline because he wants to teach you about himself. And the example for that is anybody that God has used in the scriptures. You go through Isaiah, you go through um, Ezekiel, you go through Jeremiah. Anybody that God uses, he has to give them educative discipline. Because God wants ourselves to be dethroned and him to be enthroned in the center of our lives. And therefore for that to happen, God will take you through educative discipline. Everybody, all of us, are, get all kinds of discipline. All three kinds of discipline. But let me ask you a question. At which level are you predominantly? Are you at that retributive level? Where your sin is, your Christian life is punctuated with sin after sin after sin after sin. Or are you at the next level up? predominantly where your Christian life is always on the very edge of sin all the time. Without educative discipline, God cannot use a person because then they will bring the baggage of self to the table. The more God wants to use you, the more he will discipline you first. When God wants to drill a man and thrill a man and skill a man, when he wants to mold a man to play the noblest part, when he yearns with all his heart to create so great and bold a man that all the world might be amazed, watch his methods, watch his ways, how he ruthlessly perfects whom he royally elects, how he hammers and hurts him and with mighty blows converts him into trial shapes of clay that only God understands, while his tortured heart is crying and he lifts beseeching hands, how he bends but never breaks, how his good God undertakes, how he uses whom he chooses with every purpose fuses him, with mighty acts induces him to try his splendor out. God knows what he's about. It was A.W. Tozer who said, whom God will use greatly, he will hurt deeply. How is it possible that the worst parts of our lives work together for good? And that's there at the beginning of this verse. God causes All things work together for good is an incomplete verse until you put the fact that God causes all things to work together. All things don't work together by chance. It is God who causes it. He arranges circumstances. So there is no luck or chance for a believer. It is God working the circumstances. God working the experiences for a believer. But we have difficulty submitting to the will of God. Submitting to the sovereignty of God. Sometimes a submission to God's sovereignty is like this conversation that this man has with the father of his love interest. Sung by lead singer Nasri Tony Atwe of the Canadian reggae fusion band Magic in their song Rude from the album Don't Kill the Magic. So he's having this conversation with the father of his love interest. Saturday morning, jumped out of bed and put on my best suit. Got in my car, raced like a jet all the way to you. Knocked on your door with heart in my hand to ask you a question because I know that you're an old-fashioned man. This is the question. Can I have your daughter for the rest of my life? Say yes, say yes, because I need to know. And this is the answer. You say I'll never get your blessing till the day I die. Tough like my friend, but the answer is no. This is his response in response to the answer. Why you got to be so rude? (laughs) Don't you know I'm human too? Why you got to be so rude? I'm going to marry her anyway. Marry that girl. Marry her anyway. Marry that girl, no matter what you say. Marry that girl and we'll be a family. This is how sometimes we come to God seeking his will. You're an old-fashioned man. I'm going to ask you a will. But if you say no, 
I'm going to marry her anyway. What is the sovereignty of God? A.W. Pink in his book, Sovereignty of God, says it eloquently. I should not sully it. He says the supremacy of God, it is the supremacy of God, the kingship of God, the Godhood of God. To say that God is sovereign is to declare that God is God and that he is the most high, doing according to his will in the army of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth so that none can stay his hand. The sovereignty of God is seen throughout scripture. Joseph, Ruth, Esther, Christ, the life of Christ. So then the problem is that we like the sovereignty of God, but we think it opposes free will. If God is sovereign and his internal call guarantees a response, then is there free will? Well, there is free will because in the Garden of Eden, God told Adam and Eve... He gave them the choice to obey or disobey, knowing that they would disobey. But he still gave them the choice. So how do we reconcile the sovereignty of God and the free will of man? How many of you play chess? Or you've played chess in the past, or you know about chess, you put those letters together. Okay. <laughs> uh, now, Chess is a game that's, that started in India thousands of years ago, and the previous champion in chess was this Russian guy by the name of Gary Kasparov. So imagine, when I was 15 years old, I was a nerd, and I followed uh, um, the chess championships, and I would play both sides of the chess, but never mind. Um, <laughs> imagine that I was playing chess with the world champion. Okay, Gary Kasparov and I, are playing chess, okay? I make my moves, he makes his moves. Some people are kind of looking at him, looking at me. This is some... He's making his moves and I'm making my move. I am free to make any move I want. Eventually, the will of Gary Kasparov will prevail because he will destroy me in the game. <laughs> so is it with the sovereignty of God and the free will of man. You can make any move you want. You're free. At the same time, the sovereignty of God still rules. It's not either or it's both and. Israel Today translated a report from a Hebrew language site in which they noted that the Iron Dome battery failed three times to intercept an incoming rocket that was headed towards Tel Aviv in the recent uh, skirmish between Palestine and Israel. So this is the direct words of their commander. He said a missile was fired from Gaza and the Iron Dome precisely calculated its trajectory. And so they knew that that missile from Gaza was going to hit one of three places. The Kiria, which is Israel's equivalent of the Pentagon, the Israeli towers, or a central Tel Aviv railway station, and each of them would have resulted in mass casualties. So their Iron Dome interceptor located the um, location, the trajectory of the missile and sent an interceptor. The first one missed. The second one missed. This is very rare. I mean, they don't miss. So this, this commander says, I was in shock. At this point, we had just four seconds before the missile would have hit one of these three places, and we had sent out the call for uh, mass evacuation. Suddenly, the Iron Dome, which was the interceptor, located, um, noticed wind changes coming from the east. And he says, 
that a major wind came from the east so strong that it blew that missile into the sea. And in his own words, we were all stunned. I stood up and shouted, there is a God. I witnessed this miracle with my own eyes. I saw the hand of God send that missile into the sea. Chance? No. In the 1920s, Stalin, Joseph Stalin, ordered a purge of all the Bibles in Russia and all the believers. So the believers were taken to prison and killed there. In 1995, in the journal Scocaster, uh, which, which is released yearly by the Schofield Church in Dallas, Texas, they wrote this article and they said that recently somebody remembered that the Bibles were not burned, they were actually stored in warehouses. So the government sent out trucks to go retrieve these Bibles. And so there were these teenage kids that came to work just to go and retrieve the Bibles and bring them back. So there was this one kid that was a teenager and he was an agnostic. He didn't care about the Bible. He just wanted to get some money. So he went with this truck, went to the warehouse. So this, this purging happened in the 1920s. This is the 1990s, 70 years later, when they are coming to this warehouse. So they came to this warehouse, opened the warehouse, and they saw thousands of Bibles. So this young kid uh, decided to steal a Bible. So he stole a Bible, and uh, sometime later they couldn't find him. They didn't know where he was. They look for him, and they find him on the other side of the building crying. And they asked him what happened. So he... he takes the Bible that he stole out of thousands of Bibles and he opens the front cover of the Bible and there on the first page is his grandmother's handwriting. She was killed for her faith but that was her Bible. Chance? God is sovereign. A parable by Donald Barnhouse, the great illustrator. He said that a man was, had a beautiful garden and Satan was his neighbor. So one day he was taking God through this garden. And as he was taking God through this garden, he found that Satan had come in and was cutting down some trees. And so he was mad and said, why are you cutting down trees? So then God told him, I wanted to build you a house. And those are the trees that I would have cut down anyway. When Satan is cutting down trees in your life, those are the trees God would have cut down anyway. I don't know what your circumstance is. I don't know what problems you go through. I don't know what bad experiences you go through. But this thing I know is that God has never lost control. Not for one second. I'm going to give the opportunity for anybody who wants to respond to the sermon. If there's anybody who has never invited Jesus into your life, you can stand up and we will pray together. If there is anybody who on thinking about it, does not really love God continuously. And you want to change that, you can also stand up and we will pray together. Or maybe there's somebody here who is on the first level of discipline. Sin after sin after sin and wants to get up to the next stage. You can also stand up. God cannot use you if he cannot discipline you. I dare you to stand up and ask God to discipline you. I dare you. That's one of the hardest prayers you will pray. But without God disciplining you, he cannot use you. We will pray after the song.